This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. What's up, everybody? Thanks for checking out this episode of the podcast. We appreciate you. It's Jesperson here with uh, John Hicks. Hi-o. And uh, this is one of those shows... I think that you and I get really excited about me because uh, we get to talk to a lot of people and pick their brains, John, and you because you get to push every button at that control panel. Uh, we're going to go in, in just a second <laughs> live to the uh, the electoral district of Edmonton White Mud, where we'll talk to Racky Pancholi, who just withdrew from the Alberta NDP leadership race. Then You're we're painting a picture right we're, now. We're, we're, we're going to rip over to Ukraine. Uh, we're going to check in live with Kevin Royal, an yeah. Edmonton firefighter who's over there. He'll be yeah. supported by Nikki Booth, who will join us here in studio with, sure. with Firefighter Age Ukraine. And then uh, we're going to talk to Danny Parody, who's going to tell us about her time, an APTN journalist with a new podcast series out, The Place That Thaws, about her journey up north. Uh, talking to longtime residents of that region, although there's there's a caveat there. There's an asterisk there, as Danny explains in her series. Okay, uh, but indigenous people living in uh, the far north that are seeing uh, the real time, uh, very real life impacts of climate change. Danny's oh, nice. done a, a six part podcast series where she's going to tell us about that. So this episode is going to move. Amazing. My man. I am going to push all these buttons. I often say that to people. I'm like, I'm a glorified button pusher. And then uh, the other night, someone was like, no, you're literally a button pusher. You know who else are <laughs> you know who else is like glorified button pushers or like airline pilots, uh, people that land rockets on the moon. Don't compare me to astronauts no, this early to, in the I'm, morning. I'm just saying credit where it's due. Uh, but let's not mess around because we have limited time with Racky Pancholi. Everybody wants that interview, and we're going to get to her in just a quick second. It's made possible by the team at verifiablecredentials.ca. You've probably been hearing about these stories in the news, uh, whether it's like seniors, their long-term care being compromised, or maybe folks safety being compromised out in the oil patch there's a ton of examples nurses as well as a good one of people basically uh well they're they're saying that they are who who they aren't they're faking their credentials and it's putting a lot of people's safety at risk uh luckily there's an innovative technology that's being developed right here in alberta by the team at we know training they're called digital verifiable credentials my friends you're going to be hearing more and more and more and more about digital credentials digital ids this is a thing that is on the radar of governments everywhere, whether it's healthcare cards or driver's licenses, you name it, they're secure cloud based credentials that go way beyond what the traditional measures have offered. They're tamper proof independently verifiable they're real time they live in a digital wallet you you get the idea right they don't screw around is basically the point and with we know training they can plug seamlessly into your training courses if you want to learn more about using verifiable credentials in your training or credentialing program make sure you visit verifiablecredentials.ca a lot of people showing love for Rocky yesterday online. A lot of people oh, upset man. about this. This was this was kind of uh, we're, we're we're not making light of anything, um, but but you and I both I think felt a little bit for Gil McGowan yesterday because of yesterday yeah. yesterday was was the big launch of Gil's campaign to lead the Alberta NDP. But it wasn't. But like the twelve news. minutes before he joins us here on Real Talk, Rocky announces she's out of the race, and then that just like dominates every single news headline. I mean, that was the story. Everybody uh, was curious to see, uh, is, rather, is curious to see how this leadership race is going to play out. And you could not ignore the enormous splash that the MLA from Edmonton White Mud made when she launched that campaign uh, right here on Real Talk, seeing immediate support. Uh, But it wasn't meant to be, I guess, Racky Pancholi joining us live this morning. Thanks for making time for us. I know everybody wants this interview, Racky. Good morning, Ryan. It's great to be here. I appreciate the chance to to see you again. Yeah, I got, so I get a text from, uh, we never reveal our sources, but I got a text yesterday about 5.30 in the morning and it says, have you heard the news about Racky? And I went, well, that's kind of an interesting, what do you mean the news about Racky? So I replied with the question mark and, and this person said she's withdrawing from the race and endorsing Nahed. And I just replied in all caps, what? When did you know that this was the right decision for you? 
Oh, let me just begin by saying, Ryan, it it wasn't an easy decision because, uh, you know, I am very, very proud of the campaign uh, that we've run uh, since, you know, since the decision to run, but which, uh, you know, we have a launch, but really those decisions come a long time ahead of time. You talk to people and you, I've been listening as an MLA for years, talking to Albertans from corner to corner of this province. And I felt really strongly about the kind of campaign I wanted to put forward and why I wanted to run for leader was to really tap into what I was hearing from uh, Albertans about wanting to hear more about the hope and optimism of this province and the opportunity that brought us here from many of us came from other countries, other parts of, uh, of this country to make Alberta home and that need to talk about an optimistic view of, of our of our future uh, that delivers for all of us. Like that's what I wanted to talk about. So I have to begin by saying I just, I'm so grateful to um, the thousands of Albertans who uh, engaged with me, listened to me. I sat in lots of uh, cafes and homes across the province talking to people. And look, every, every candidate's gonna say this, but I single-handedly had the best team of people um, supporting me uh, and, and volunteers who are knocking on, well, not, not so much knocking on doors as picking up the phone and calling people. Um, but it's been a great privilege and um, I'm really proud of what we did. And it's because of that work, because I've been clear right from the beginning that my view is that if the Alberta NDP is going to be government in 2027, we need to grow our party and growing our party means talking to more Albertans across the province, making sure that they get a chance to connect with us, but also to see that their values, the things that they care about the most. And let me be clear, I actually feel very strongly that Albertans have a lot of shared values. Uh, They care about a strong public education system, public health care, a strong economy with resilient jobs. These are the things that Albertans care about. And um, and in order to make sure that they're reflected in our party, we needed to make sure we were more open and they needed to see that we share those values. So growing our party was key. For me, to, you know, to answer your question of sort of when did I, I have a sense of this was the time to perhaps um, step back from my campaign um, was really last late last week. Um, uh, you know, we got some uh, updated membership numbers from the party that really made it clear that um, since Nahid Menshi entered the race, um, he has done an incredible job of doing the very thing that I wanted to do and that I'm still committed to doing, which is growing our party. And to me, um, there's always been a shared vision that both Nahed and I have about not really caring about, you know, what political party were you a member of before? Um, Let's actually get down to making, uh, building a party that is home for more and more Albertans. Um, You know, I I connect, I understand that, that was my vision as well. And uh, to me, those numbers are pretty clear that there is uh, better value uh, for our party, for our members to step back and to unite behind Nahed, uh, because I do believe that he and I share the same goals and vision. Okay, so you, you kind of feel like the writing's on the wall a little bit, um, and uh, you're, you're not a quitter, obviously, um, but there's, there's got to be some strategy to when uh, you decide to, 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 to pull the pin on it, right? Did it have anything to do with, with fundraising? We were speculating a little bit on the show yesterday. I've heard politicians in past say once they've, 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 they know the, the fate of a leadership run or the fate of a campaign, if they know they're not going to see it through, they don't want to keep asking people for donations. Was that part of it for you? It was not. I have to tell you that our campaign uh, is very, very strong and was very, very strong. And we were going, for me, it wasn't actually about uh, the strength of our campaign so much as saying, look, we have shared values. Let's get behind it. To me, um, like I'm, we were, I kind of wanted to go when it was the right time uh, for us, which to me, it was a a bit of a a position of strength for us uh, to say, look, I, I'm going to boast a little bit, Ryan, but I feel very strongly that we ran one of the best campaigns in this leadership race. We have a lot of momentum of volunteers and fundraising and support. And we thought this is not about, um, you know, letting our campaign sort of dwindle away. It was actually about saying, look, let's bring this force of our campaign, the strength of our campaign to unite with Nahed and say, let's get behind the shared vision. I have a lot of things I want to bring to Nahed's campaign. And and last night he uh, he made me as executive chair of his campaign and I'm going to be bringing a lot of the views and the values and the energy that we had in our campaign to his which I think is only going to make it stronger uh, and that's what I'm excited to do. Yeah, I mean, 
obviously there's people online, take it for what it's worth, which, which might be nothing, but uh, it's got to feel good to hear that people are saying that, you know, they, they perceive Nahed to be the front runner and then they'll say, and now with Rocky's endorsement, uh, you know, this thing appears to be a done deal. There's no way in hell that the Hoffman and Ganley campaigns are going to buy into that, though. What went into your decision to endorse the the quote-unquote outsider. The other two are your existing, current, incumbent colleagues at the Alberta legislature. He's not. That's bound to maybe make a few waves. Let me just be clear, and I've said it before. I uh, I am very privileged to have run in this campaign uh, in this race with incredible candidates, including my colleagues in the legislature, Sarah Hoffman, Kathleen Ganley, Jody Callahan stonehouse uh, and of course, Gil McGowan as well. And so I just want to say that this was not about, for me, it was about a shared vision. I've always taken the position as somebody who, yes, has served with the M, uh, with the NDP for five years as an MLA, but I came in in 2019 as a as a brand new member of the party and a brand new member of the legislature. And I've always viewed myself as somebody who wants to bring in more people. Um, and I've never been hung up on how somebody might have voted in the past or, or what their values were. To me, it was always about, let's get together, let's have a conversation, let's find some common ground, um, and let's bring in as many people as possible. And when I've seen both what Nahed's been able to do in terms of uh, his first week or so in the ele- in the race, but really what he's done in the past is he's that position of sort of being nonpartisan um, uh, in the past has really said to people like, I'm going to make decisions based on on pragmatic approaches, the best evidence before me. And that is very much how I see myself. So to me, this was is not about saying, uh, you know, the, the viability of any other candidate or their race. It was about sharing an aligned vision for the goals of the party party, but also uh, for the future of this province. And so that's really what it what it came down to for me was really um, Nahed and I share that vision. And I'm excited to be a key part of his campaign team and to continue the work of growing our party and winning in 2027. Uh, Gil was was pretty critical of Nahed yesterday in his interview on, on Real Talk, basically talking about how he's a celebrity that's come in with no policy. Was there something about what uh, Mr. Nenshi has put out there that that really uh, caused you to believe or that, that swayed you in the direction of endorsing him? Is there, is there like one thing, one issue, one approach in particular that really resonated with you? For me, it's more of his approach of being open to more people to join the party. Like, that's really what it was. Like, Nahed Nenshi was mayor of Calgary for 11 years. I don't think anybody can say that he hasn't taken positions on things. Uh, he's taken many, many positions. So, uh, you know, we will likely see more more policy. And last night, you know, uh, Nahed was, he had a meet and greet, as we call it here in, in Edmonton, with an incredible turnout. But during that conversation, he, of course, got asked questions about um, some of his positions on things. And he, I, I appreciate very much that he acknowledged the incredible work that that my campaign has done uh, on putting forward very thoughtful, well considered positions on things like climate action, on education, on health care. Um, and uh, I very much anticipate that we're going to have uh, a lot of great opportunity to put forward good ideas together. But I certainly don't think anybody can accuse Nahad Nenshu of being light on policy. I know that you're not afraid of any question. This from Jillian in our live chat on YouTube, who says Nahad Nenshi will be the Jason Kenny of the NDP. Uh, I guess that means he might become premier, but she says an opportunist who didn't put in any of the hard work has no real skin in the game who will build the party around his ego and the NDP will lose its grassroots feel. Uh, Is that a risk that the party runs? Look, I think whenever somebody comes in from outside of a party to lead, which, by the way, has happened many, many times, and Daniel Smith did the same thing with the UCP, um, there's always going to be um, questions about, you know, uh, the their familiarity and comfort level with the party itself. That is a challenge that Nahed is certainly uh, has to bring on, take on, and it's certainly one that he is aware of. And I think that's the value that, of course, uh, somebody like myself as executive chair of his campaign, but also, uh, you know, somebody who knows the party and been around for quite a while now and uh, and certainly understands the challenges. Um, look, this is about growth and uh we can you know the the insider outsider view of of who should be leading this party who should be a member of this party has never served us well that only serves us to uh, remain in opposition and i want to be very clear that we need to bring more albertans in with big ideas uh he's clearly brought more people to our party in the last two weeks uh than we had seen in quite some time you know i was in that room yesterday uh in edmonton at that rally and i asked the crowd and i said you know 
show of hands, tell me how many of you in this room have been longtime members of the Alberta NDP. And I'd say about, you know, a third to, to a half of the room put up their hand and said, yeah, they've been longtime members. And then I said, how many of you have just joined in this race, maybe even in the last few weeks? And another huge portion of that room, half that room put up their hand. And I even asked how many of you are here saying you're still deciding. And yeah, there were some hands up saying they're still deciding whether or not to be a member. And that is the reason why I think that we, uh, Nahed is the right leader because he's bringing in all of those people, those who've been longtime members, those who are new to the party, and those of them and are looking at us for the very first time. My message to all of those Edmontonians and those Albertans who are thinking the same way is you are welcome here. You are welcome in our party. And that is very much Nahed's message. And that's how we're going to make sure that more Albertans see that our values reflect their values and why we should be government in 2027. Okay, you're keeping it classy, but I want to ask you about this. Uh, a tweet from Alberta's Minister of Transportation Economic Corridors. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Uh, Devin Dreeshin, quote tweets, uh, puts out your video, uh, reposts your video where you announced uh, your decision yesterday and says, sorry, running for leader only two weeks, uh, then dropping out is the highlight of your career. Call me. Let's get a road paved for your constituents. Uh, what's your response to the minister? I have no response to Devin Dreeshin. Uh, honestly, I thank him for uh, amplifying my message to Albertans. Rocky Pancholi is the MLA for Edmonton White Mud. Uh, a lot of feedback in the live chat. Uh, Want to let you know, maybe I'll, I'll read Idris is here, uh, who says Rocky came into this campaign with big ideas. That got my attention for sure. She's still going to be an expansive Force that from Idris in our YouTube live chat. Uh, Racky, thanks for this. We look forward to seeing what's next. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the chance to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks. you got it. Uh, let us know what you think about this talk at ryanjesperson.com is where you can uh, send us an email. Uh, your thoughts on this? How does this change the NDP leadership race? Obviously, yesterday, also an announcement. Gil McGowan's in. Uh, he sat down with us. He talked about his vision. Is Gil the next Peter Lougheed? <laughs> that was that was easily the moment of the interview, right? I, I I audibly made a sound, but I wasn't laughing. It's just it's that's a it's a bold statement to yeah. make. So so he didn't he didn't claim that he is the next Peter Lougheed, but he said he would like to be, and he explains what that means and and how that translates into policy. And you can check out uh, that episode of Real Talk if you didn't happen to watch it already. That's our March 26th episode. Uh, we've now sat down with uh, the uh, every single one of the candidates, at least the ones that have declared to this point in the Alberta NDP leadership race. And you can find all of those conversations uh, in our YouTube archive or, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up in just a second, uh, we're going to head over to Ukraine. We're going to talk to an Edmonton firefighter over there, Kevin Royal and Nikki Booth. Uh, who's working with Kevin in that crew. She was over there in January. Uh, she's going to join us in studio talking about this uh, remarkable uh, initiative, Firefighter Aid Ukraine. Uh, that coming up in just a second. These conversations are made possible with the support of Real Talk partners like our friends at Eden Landscaping who want to remind you that this is the time of year where you're going to want to reach out to your landscape designer. If you want to have your work done by summer if you want to have shovels in the ground in spring you're going to want to start that conversation that design conversation now they've been bringing outdoor spaces to life for more than 20 years a custom landscape builder uh, with a ton of on the ground experience in edmonton and surrounding area whatever your vision is they can execute it uh, for us you know one example in our backyard we had huge drainage problems every time we'd get a big rain just make an absolute mess back there for days sometimes weeks and we also, of course, have some big dogs that we love very much, but that takes its toll on real grass. And so they cooked up a solution for us that fit our budget, fit our timeline, and everything else they can do the same for you. Uh, master designers, and of course, their project. Uh, I mean, the work is impeccable. You can see it for yourself online. That's Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. If the investment in your home is going to be inside, if you're looking to declutter, get organized, you're going to want to check out californiaclosets.ca. You can request that free consultation with their designers. That's where it all starts. You talk to them about what you have in mind for, uh, could be a big walk-in closet. It could be something relatively modest, like a, a mudroom, a boot room for your family. Maybe you want to just get your garage organized. You can check out the work that they do and get in touch with their design team. Again, that website is californiaclosets.ca. Are you looking for a change of pace when it comes to your career? 
Are you looking to maybe educate yourself in a field that's always captured your attention? Uh, you've always dreamed of getting a post-secondary education, but there's been barriers in the way. There's been hurdles. There's been challenges. Could be your geographical location. Could be the fact you have a full-time job. You're looking after your parents. You're looking after kids. Whatever it is, you're going to find a fit at Athabasca University. You can find them online at AthabascaU.ca. That's where you can learn more about the AU Advantage by choosing Athabasca University as your post-secondary institution, you'll benefit from flexible study options, accessibility for students around the world, and a supportive community. Your education, your way at AthabascaU.ca. And we want to remind you as well uh, that as we're talking about this next initiative, that the Real Talk community comes together. We come together to make change in our own communities and abroad, and that's what this is all about. We're going to be talking to the team from Firefighter Aid Ukraine in just a split second, and we want to let you know right now that when you're hearing about these interviews, when you're connecting with these people via this show, make sure you check the show notes on the podcast or on YouTube. You'll find links to all the guests that we talk to, as well as uh, where you can learn more information about what they're doing. As we welcome uh, Nikki Booth to our Real Talk studio, back to our Real Talk studio. It's nice to see your face. Good to see you too. And Johnny, are we good to go uh, to Ukraine right now? Kevin Royal is uh, joining us uh, from Ukraine, an Edmonton firefighter over there. And Kevin, we're not saying exactly where you are uh, for security reasons, but why don't you tell us exactly what's going on? I think we've got you on mute, pal. Uh, maybe just check your uh, feed, check your inputs, your outputs. And uh, we'll get that organized. Everything. There, we can hear you loud Everything and clear, buddy. Here. We got gotcha. you. All right, perfect. Yeah, well, you know, we're just wrapping up two, uh, two deployments we're conducting simultaneously here in Ukraine. And, uh, yeah, everything's gone pretty well so far. Uh, we were delivering a, a, a canine trained in explosive detection to uh, one of the regions, one of the, uh, the agencies that deals with homeland security and, and the protection of the public. So that went extremely well. And we are wrapping up the advanced medical, field medical training program right now as well. This is a this is a dog. Like, I want to get people, for people that aren't familiar with what Firefighter Aid uh, Ukraine is all about, um, you and your teams, um, and Nikki, you were just there in January. We'll hear about your trip. Yeah, last January. Uh, last January. Yeah. Um, but your teams have been uh, providing tactical combat, casualty care training, advanced medical care training. Uh, but Kevin, your involvement in Ukraine started uh, well before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How did this all get started? Yeah, it's, it started in two, well, I was inspired in 2012 when I was fortunate enough to take part in a rotary group study exchange to Ukraine that was focused on emergency services. And when I was on that trip, I got to, I was exposed to what they were dealing with as far as uh, lack of equipment and the conditions and the, um, uh, just the, the barriers and the, the hurdles they, they had to overcome to, to do their job. So when I came back to Canada, I founded uh, Firefighter Aid Ukraine with the help of some other firefighters. And we started delivering equipment and it just, it just kept snowballing and it kept going well. And we just kept getting asked to continue. And it's evolved into something much greater, much, much greater. So, uh, Nikki, how did you get involved with this organization? Well, I used to work for Edmonton Fire Rescue and I met Kevin and the guys and then um, come the pandemic, I needed something to do. So I volunteered in the warehouse and saw Kevin there and I said, hey, if you need any help with your communications, let me know. And within a week, I was on the board and <laughs> doing doing this. So I thank Kevin for <laughs> for changing my life, honestly. Well, this is I mean, this is no joke, though, the, no, the, the work that this group has been doing and and the magnitude of, of the importance of, of this training. What what did you see when when you went over there about 15 months ago? I mean, I saw resilient people. I saw people that are so grateful for the support um, that we provide and the, our willingness to to go over to Ukraine. Um, I think they, you know, the fact that they're in an invasion and, and dealing with what they deal with, and then you have. Uh, these Canadians that want to come over and, and provide training support and, and continually provide gear. I mean, um, I've built relationships with people uh, that I maintain over in Ukraine now. And um, but the resiliency of the people is is something that uh, is life changing for me, too. Kevin, can you talk to us about Torch, about this dog that you brought over there? I understand yeah, sure. uh, trained in Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. Torch is uh, Torch is actually the brother of the Edmonton Fire Rescue arson dog. 
person detection dog and he came to us through alberta canine um he's a belgian malinois and he's trained in a, a number of different um scents that the He's able to detect a number of different explosive compounds. He's also trained in, in other aspects of, uh, of civil protection. So uh, Alberta Canine came to us and said, hey, we want to help out Ukraine. We have this canine that we can train up. Uh, can you help us find a home for him? So we worked with them. They worked with um, the recipient here in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, here we are. We're delivering them. We actually had meetings with multiple uh, agencies, so the DSNS, who handles a lot of demining in uh, deoccupied areas. Uh, we had meetings with uh, the National Guard and also with the border security, and they all use canines in different areas. But uh, some some regions in Ukraine, the detection aspect of of a canine is is relatively new. So they they got the chance to meet Matt and Kelsey, and a lot of questions. Uh, lots more work going to happen in the coming months. And potentially some some additional canines will be brought over here. How is how is this going to change uh, the work that's doing over there? I mean, I mean, I, I would imagine it's obviously going to kind of keep more human beings uh, more safe. Yeah. But can can you take us through it? Yeah. Well, um, for every year of conflict, they estimate about ten years of demining, and the landmass in Ukraine that's littered with, uh, with unexploded ordnance and landmines is greater than the size of Great Britain. It's uh, expected to be one of the most uh, critical problems uh, that Ukraine is going to be dealing with post-war. And uh, this will give, just give them another tool in the tool chest to, to mitigate those those uh, those explosive compounds. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, I mean, really something I think that a lot of Albertans can be proud of, but it's reiterating that there's huge need over there, Nikki. And, and I, my understanding is a big part of what you're doing for this agency is coordinating donations and, and helping people understand the value of these uh, contributions. How, how did your perspective change uh, since you started getting involved with this group and doing more work? Well, I, I think it, in Alberta, Canada, North America, we're so fortunate not to know what it's like to be experiencing what Ukrainians are experiencing every day. You know, they're they're dealing with bombings and and air raid sirens and and things like that. And and we're so far removed from it, we don't see that. So one of the things that I do is I share the stories um, from Ukraine on our Facebook page just to remind people that that this is still going on and and there is a need. I mean, there a couple weeks ago. Odessa, um, they, the emergency services responded to a bombing there, and then Ukraine attacked the first responders as they're responding. So you Russia, have, Ukraine, Russia, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. sorry, Russia. <laughs> It's early. Uh, Russia uh, attacked the, the the first responders from Ukraine that were responding to um, the Odessa incident, and they killed first responders and citizens and, and injured them. So this is why it's so important that they have PPE and because it gets mm -hmm. destroyed. But we need to help um, first responders try and get home safe. And, um, you know, meeting first responders over there, uh, seeing how passionate they are about the work that they do, the risks that they put themselves in. Um, I mean, how can you not want to help them and continue like pushing this work and, and, and raising awareness with people here to help donate and, and support us. It's astounding what, what your group, Firefighter Aid Ukraine, is doing, um, sending uh, shipments of uh, support, including PPE, uh, bunker gear, uh, you know, that sort of thing over on a monthly basis. The numbers are staggering, Kevin, 300 tons of uh, PPE the group has shipped over to Ukraine. What, what are these firefighters wearing? What sort of equipment are they using uh, prior to receiving these donations? Um, it depends on the region. It depends on the, the department. Some of the equipment's been stolen, destroyed, looted. Um, and some of it's just getting worn out so quickly because of the, the number of incidents and the magnitude of the incidents that they're they're responding to. Uh, again, like the structural collapse from a rocket is, is a lot different than uh, uh, what we deal with here, right? But uh, we do have the tools to help them mitigate those incidences so those are the types of items that we're we're shipping over you know especially rescue equipments like um lifting bags or extrication tools and so they uh they don't have enough of it really they, they do have some of it they're coming from other countries but we're just trying to fill that gap that's uh, that exists Kevin, why is this so important to you like why do you care so much about this in particular the, the, I mean this is a huge part of your life 
Um, the, uh, the fire world is very, very close knit, very tight. Um, I was just inspired when I was over there. These are people that have built relationships over the years, and I continue to build relationships when we're here each time. They, these are people like Nikki said that are they're they're sticking their neck out. Um, they're they're doing a job that a lot of people aren't willing to or aren't able to do, but they just they do it daily and they uh, they do it selflessly. And it's a humanitarian aid crisis. They, these are people that are. You know, there it was a sovereign nation, a peaceful nation that was attacked from a uh, attacked by a fascist government, and uh, they need all the help they can get. Can I add to that? Please I would do. tell you that Kevin is one of the most compassionate, passionate people I've ever met. His desire to help not only the people in Ukraine but to support all of us on the team and everyone that knows Kevin. Um, I would say Kevin is is just one of the best people I've ever met, and he inspires me and. You know, he's just so invested in all of our lives and um, it makes him a pretty special person and it takes a pretty special person to run a, a group like this. Huh. Tell us about the checks in the mail. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but you know what? It's Wondering how he'd navigate that. Had. He's not uh, good at taking you know, compliments. It might, it's worth saying though, it's, we have also helped other countries um, yeah. in need. So we, we work with other agencies and we support other fire services around the world too. So. Our Ukraine is our focus. It was our original focus and it will remain our primary focus, but it doesn't mean we don't assist other fire services and other agencies. Yeah, you shipped a truck to Mexico, didn't you? No, uh, Lebanon, actually. Oh, Lebanon. Pardon I, me. Okay. I was wrong. Yeah. That, well, I gave the wrong information. Well, Sorry. no, I mean, I just think it's fascinating <laughs> that, that this this type of stuff is happening. Um, uh, but you, you, you are looking for the support of the general public as well. Like the average citizen or civilian is going to look at this and say, well, I don't have access to jaws of life. I, I can't yeah. donate that kind of stuff. But I... I I would imagine that cash donations help as well. Uh, cash donations are great. So we have a couple of things. One thing is we tell people instead of buying your Starbucks or your Tim Hortons co coffee or, or whomever you buy your coffee from, just if you can donate that money on our page, $5 from, you know, many people makes a big difference. But we also have a fundraiser going on at the West Edmonton Water Park on April 13th. We're selling tickets. Um, you can buy the tickets uh, on our website or you can go to our Facebook page and, and find, uh, you know, information about it there. But uh, the event is April 13th from 6.30 to 9.30. It's discounted tickets. So instead of being $65 a person, it's $40 a person um, for people to attend this event at the water park if people are like eh, the water park's not really my thing what they can do is they can still make a donation they can still buy a ticket and we're going to use that those tickets to get families that are here um, from ukraine to be able to go and enjoy uh a, an evening at the water park oh amazing yeah. okay is, is the best way for people to connect with you through your facebook page probably yeah i would highly recommend our facebook page um just because they can see the stories um of what's going on uh in ukraine but our 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 website is also pretty important to us because there's that donation link as well so yeah absolutely it, it just takes a few dollars and that adds up pretty quickly but it allows us to do what kevin and the team are doing over in ukraine right now and it helps us with um shipments but i think we also have to give a shout out to a lot of our partners like Airlink, um, to Nova Ukraine. Um, Kevin might have some others that he wants to mention because they are like so valuable in helping us achieve the work that we do as well. Hmm. Kevin, you want to add to yeah, that? I can't forget. Yeah, absolutely. Can't forget like uh, County Ukraine Foundation. We work closely with Rotary Clubs um, here in, in Ukraine and in Canada. Uh, we have a lot of spots and support from other just small businesses and medium-sized businesses, even large businesses. So communities uh, around the world as well. So, but yeah, County Ukraine Foundation is probably our, our largest financial supporter. So I have to give a shout out and plug to them. Absolutely. So, Kev, you, you, you and your uh, delegation will be will, will be on their way home soon. What's Can I ask, uh, this is kind of a personal question, what's the adjustment like when you come back? Uh, you, you, you're literally in a war zone right now. Uh, and, and you come back. It's, it's worse coming home. It's worse coming home. The jet lag bothers me going that way. So that's the yeah. the real. <laughs> It'll take me a while. Yeah. Huh. But I don't have time. I'm right back to work two days after I get back. So thank God I work shift work, I guess. Right. Maybe that's a, bon a bonus. Yeah, I guess. Dedication not just to Firefighter Age Ukraine, but to the citizens of Edmonton that he serves. But I agree with Kevin that the jet lag coming back is hard. Um, it's it's so quiet when you come back and and you know i i really missed people for a long time like it was it felt like i was there and and had a passion and a purpose and and coming home and and realizing that i was in safety and security every day and there were people that i had 
met and, and formed relationships with that um, were not. So that for me was the tough part. Yeah. Hmm. That's Nikki Booth uh, and Kevin Royal. Kevin joining us live from Ukraine. Kev, thanks for coordinating this and making it happen. Uh, I know it's a challenge with time zones and everything else considered. Uh, and Nikki, for the amazing work that you're doing. Again, people can check out firefighteraidukraine.com or uh, search Firefighter Aid Ukraine on Facebook. Keep up the amazing work. You're making us all proud. And shout out to Torch the dog over there who's going to be doing some pretty amazing work. Yeah, he's pretty cute too. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I love it. Firefighteraidukraine.com. Uh, in just a second, we'll check in with journalist Danny Parody about her new podcast series, a six part series for APTN News. Uh, a remarkable uh, firsthand report. Uh, Danny talked to the people that live in Canada's north, in many uh, circumstances, their families have been there for generations and they've seen big changes relating uh, to climate change. But the way that she tells the story uh, really is uh, worth your time and, and worth a listen. But first, uh, we want to get to uh, Jasper. We want to get to Jasper National Park. And, and every Wednesday, our friends at Tourism Jasper give us an opportunity to, to head out to the mountains and, uh, you know, I mean, this is just a reminder, your weekly reminder of the opportunity that lies in wait out in Jasper National Park. It's my Jasper memories proudly presented by our friends at Tourism Jasper. In a second, we're going to tell you about a festival that's going on out there. Uh, people are going to be having an absolute blast out in Jasper coming up in April uh, for the Pride and Ski Festival. But first, you've heard us say this many times. When you, your family, when you and your friends head out to Jasper and make your own memories, if you're posting on Instagram, uh, if you're posting on Twitter, we want you to use the hashtags MyJasper and RealTalkRJ. And that's exactly what the Widden family did. We love this. Look at these munchkins. Let me describe it for the people on the podcast. Once we saw this, uh, we reached out to them and we said, would you tell us a little bit about your trip? Um, they responded almost immediately. They said, we had an incredible weekend in Jasper. Uh, started with a long-awaited visit to Pyramid Lake Island. Um, they said we got cozy in the robes uh, that the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge kindly provided for our little ones before swim time. They said that that resort went above and beyond in every way, as always. Uh, they enjoyed a wonderful meal at Orso, a fabulous restaurant right there at the Fairmont. They said the most legendary breakfast buffet in Alberta for sure. They said we enjoyed amazing weather skiing. Marmot, we only lost the kids once. Hey, way to go, you two. Nice job. They say we played one of our best ever rounds of animal bingo as we spotted elk, caribou, deer, goats, bighorn sheep. The Widdens say all in all, it was an amazing family getaway. They say we can't wait until our next visit. Well, we love that you guys had a fantastic time out there. We love that you shared that with us as well. Thank you so very much. And we wanted to let real talkers know that coming up from April 12th through the 21st, it's the Canadian Rockies only gay ski week. It's the Jasper Pride and Ski Festival. Your chance to discover amazing spring skiing and fun events through the entire festival. Um, the Jasper Pride Party kicks off as well. We want to let you know on April 20th. Studio 24, they're calling it. You can go to jasperpride.ca to learn more. Uh, this is a fever dream of excess, a kaleidoscope of glitz and glamour, inclusivity, a dazzling self-expression where every corner holds a new fantasy, waiting to be discovered as you step through the doors you'll be swept into a euphoric escape where the music pulsates through the air beckoning you to the dance floor you'll see spectacular performances that blur the lines that's right they blur the lines between audience and performer inviting you into a world where anything goes indulge in themed cocktails dance with strangers lounge with new friends for a night you will never forget you can learn more about the Jasper Pride and Ski Festival by visiting jasperpride.ca. It runs April 12th through the 21st. My Jasper Memories is presented weekly right here on Real Talk by our friends at Tourism Jasper. Our good friend Danny Parody, uh, APTN journalist, ventured even further than Jasper for uh, in pursuit uh, of, of a uh, remarkable series, uh, which you have now released uh, wherever people get their podcasts. It's called The Place That Thaws. 
uh, Danny joining us in studio. Congratulations. Thank this has got to be so an much. exciting time for you. It definitely is. Um, a narrative podcast is a ton of work. So, um, you know, you get up there, you collect the stories, which was in and of itself absolutely an amazing time. And now I've got to spend more time with my friends up in the high Arctic as I, as I went through my six episode series. Amazing. How did this idea come about? Uh, my producer, Mark Blackburn, and I have both wanted to do stories on climate, but stories that talk about the people rather than the science. So, you know, like I like to say, if, even if you don't really care about climate change, I hope you do, but there's something you can get out of the lives of people who live up in the high Arctic. There's a history there that a lot of Canadians don't know, and it's a place very few of us ever get to because it's incredibly expensive and time consuming to get up there. So it's it's a real journey. Had this had this story idea uh, been been planted quite some time ago, and, and, and this was one you, you pitched to APTN, how how does this come about? Yeah, um, in 2019, um, when I was not at APTN, um, the Taluri Upamanga was a designated marine area, marine protected area. So um, that's when uh, Mark Blackburn started to want to get up there. We didn't have a chance uh, at APTN to get up until that time, and I was started working there as well. So we kind of combined what are we, which storytelling methods do we like? For me, it's about broadcasting, podcasting, uh, as well as writing. So we we wanted to do that, and then also just how do we how do we make sure that we tell stories at the local level but for you know um, the high arctic local means getting right up there so it was kind of a combination of, of a few different factors so so how does something like this you you you, you you're with a producer um you're with a talented colleague and you get uh you know a video camera and you've got your audio recording gear and you you take i would imagine a series of flights to get out there mm -hmm. and then what you just you sort of hit the ground and and start chatting with people and start building relationships yeah so um the first trip was to uh, Resolute Bay, which took me about two days. Um, I had to go up to Yellowknife and then a few other flights up to Iqaluit. Then uh, I met up with Trevor Wright, the Iqaluit reporter, and we went up to Resolute Bay. Um, when you land on the ground, you're in a community of about 170 people, um, give or take with the workers coming in and out. And uh, you're, you actually stay at a work camp because that's the only hotel in town um, there's there's two different hotels the scientists the people who fix equipment you're you're right in there with them but we went out into the community now one really interesting point that I talk on the first part of the podcast is that the um, the Inuit don't knock <laughs> on doors so I, I was walking around the community not knocking on doors but I, I went up to the hamlet office and I met somebody who told me if you knock people are just going to think you're the cops <laughs> so, so we walked we went over to the mayor's house and we walked in and just yelled into his house as you do. Wow. <laughs> um, so so you, you start connecting with these people. I love, like, I, I really liked your episode about the dog sledder. You, you do a really nice job, by the way, of, of using audio to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. You've got these, like, hungry sled dogs <laughs> barking in the back and uh, very well effective. But but uh, what, what sort of an impression did the people up there uh, leave on you immediately? The, the, it, it struck me, at least, I mean, I, I, I've heard the produced version mm -hmm. of this series, but willing to talk, willing to share their firsthand experience, maybe eager uh, to have a national or international audience, do you think? Um, it depends on the person. I think, I mean, it's kind of weird that uh, nor a southerner, as they call us, just appears in Resolute Bay. We did let people know ahead of time that we would be there, but then all of a sudden, two people who are not usually in the community are roaming around. Um, I, I definitely did a lot of things to break the ice. I think it's in episode three. Um, that includes driving into a snowbank and getting stuck and being kind of the joke of the day, which is an excellent way to get to know people. Uh, it, it took a little bit, like it, uh, there's a lot of shyness in, in small towns and communities, especially where you don't run into people when you have like that you don't know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so so for, for maybe, maybe uh, uh, to a certain degree, not to speak for everybody, but a population that's not used to having the eyes of the nation on them, a population that's maybe um, in, in kind of a sad or regrettable way used to having its plight ignored. Yeah, that is a really interesting point that you make because this community is part of two communities that were moved by the Canadian government in 1950, in the 1950s, uh, and they were relocated. They were told that they were going to have better homes, better um, better access to hunting, and they're moved from Inuk Inukjuak, which is northern Quebec. As, and so you can imagine the hunting and trapping situation in northern Quebec is vastly different than the high Arctic. So a lot of people had to 
learn a whole new way of life. Um, and yeah, at, at that time, you know, journalists didn't do their job. They just reported on it like, oh, yeah, they were using the word Eskimo at the time. So that was the word they used, like Eskimos are being moved up into the high Arctic. And it was sort of a it was sort of a shrug. So to go and be able to hear what that was like from people who were, um, you know, two or three are the people who are still survivors. But just the, the ongoing impact, but also the resilience of the community is just amazing. Hmm. This is a, 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 a community, uh, I would imagine, that has, has to a certain degree an, an oral storytelling tradition. People do, um, at least you get the impression in listening to the series, they understand what life was like uh, for their predecessors, for their ancestors. Um, what sort of changes relating to climate mm -hmm. uh, did people tell you about? Yeah, the biggest issue and, and the one that did drive us to go up there uh, was that there is not going to be sea ice by the year 20, well, 2030 was the original projection. Now they say for sure by 2050. When you, th there's people who used to trek up to the North Pole um, in the summertime and you can't do that anymore. It's melted. Uh, even when I was up there in October, which is the beginning, late October is the beginning of the dark season, meaning there's no light for several months. And there still wasn't a thaw or there still wasn't ice on the water. So that means that it's difficult to go out hunting. It's difficult to go get the food that the Inuit rely on. You know, there's no soil up there, Ryan. You're not growing any vegetables. Everything is either imported or hunted. So that was the biggest impact on the minds of people is just making sure that they can still have access to food and nutrition that's just vital for their lives. Hmm. Did, did you get the, uh, a sense of um, optimism in any sense? I mean, what, what sort of a vibe did you pick up from, from people that are seeing these uh, impacts firsthand? I think, um, I, I don't know that I would say optimism, but I mentioned resilience earlier, and that's that's a key point of what I found up in um, Resolute and Grease Fjord is that people were so... Uh, just like getting on with it, you know, like they they moved up there, they see the changes, they want to make sure that there is help from the government to actually adapt to climate change, but they also are very self-reliant people. So they do what they can. I have some pictures up from today, from last week's episode of Devin Manick making an ATV, meaning he's tying a sled to a boat uh, because, of course, the ice wasn't frozen. So now he has this ve this vehicle that he can use with his dogs. So if it's if it's um, water, he can you know behind the, he can use the boat. He can sled. So that's the kind of thing that you see up there. They're not people who are like waiting for other people to solve their problems do you get I, I want to sort of ask this question with with uh, sensitivity I, I may be a little bit ignorant on this but, but you talk about how in the 1950s um, an entire group uh, of people an entire population is moved uh, from Quebec to to where you speak with them mm -hmm. um, does that impact or influence their sense of connection to that region and in, in other words is there less of a sense of connection to the region because of that, do you think? Hmm. Uh, I mean, I'll acknowledge that that was 70 years ago, a long yeah. time for a lot of people, this is all that they've known, but. Yeah, I, that's a really interesting story. So unlike, like you're really familiar with <clears throat> prairie communities where people talk about living here since time immemorial, that is different, but there, um, there, there have been a mixture over time of people who are in Pond Inlet, which is also in the high Arctic, who've been there for, you know, the thousands of years. Uh, Inuit were a very, um, like they, there were people that moved around quite a bit. So I, I don't think that it necessarily changed their connection to the land. It's still, be it subarctic or arctic, they still have the stories and they still have the, they still have the understanding and connection that they've learned through one another. Um, but what I was surprised by was that, I mean, I, you have to think if you were relocated, that would cause some bitterness. And there were people who had trauma, there was struggle, there were people who remember really difficult moments, but they weren't bitter in the way that you would expect. They, you know, um, Larry Adualuk from Greece Fjord still really uh, considers himself a Canadian and he's quite patriotic in that point. Um, it's, it's a slightly different community up there. They didn't have the same, they did have residential schools, people were moved. They also had uh, intersections with the Indian hospitals, but you also had people who were able to stay in community and have some um, governance early on through their municipal structures, which I think changes how they manage the land. Hmm. Um, you know, you'll see, uh, you know, when, when people are discussing climate change, and, and I'm talking like at a, at a civilian mm -hmm. level, a lot of people, you know, critics in particular of, of things like carbon pricing or government action on climate change, let alone big summits like COP, mm -hmm. will say, listen, everything's cyclical. 
uh, throughout history, uh, things have happened in cycles and we've seen, you know, big freezes and big thaws mm -hmm. and, and everything that comes along with it. And this is just another part of that cyclical nature of life on planet Earth. Um, how would you respond to mm -hmm. something like that in light of your experience putting yeah. this together? Well, they, like, of course, there is a cyclical nature, um, and that's not the kind of climate change that we're talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, you had um, people in the high Arctic that actually um, can, they, they were called the Thule people. And during that time, there was grass, maybe even palm trees in the Arctic. It was, it was a warm place. But that was tens of thousands of years ago. The warming that we are seeing today is taking place over like 100 years, 150, 200 years. And it's drastically different than anything else that we've seen if you look at climate charts. So it's just, we're not talking about the same timelines. And the, the impetus for that climate change is false, is the burning of fossil fuels that creates extra heat in the environment and it's causing the warming that we're seeing. So uh, this... Um uh, how do I say this? Like, this is not a, a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> on uh, climate change. This is this is not like referring to scientific modeling and and presenting the evidence here, there, and everywhere else. It's it's anecdotal evidence. Um, how important do you think that is? The anecdotes, the firsthand mm -hmm. stories of people mm -hmm. reflecting on their and their ancestors' experiences in shaping the conversation uh, in Canada and around the world, for that matter. Yeah. Well, the wonderful thing about a podcast is you can let the story unfold in a, in a long way. You know, we're talking about um, half hour each week. So you have people who are talking about their lived experience. You ha you're asking people what, what it's like to be up there. And then also I do eventually get to the science. But I, I think the most important part to start with is that lived experience and indigenous knowledge. That is something that was, this will shock you, but the government has ignored uh, the Inuit when they talked about the cycles or what they've noticed for changes. Um, and when it comes to hunting, as you can imagine, if you live off of hunt, like the if you live off of hunting, you really um, are somebody who pays attention to the seasons and the changes. So the people that um, that felt that they were ignored had a chance to speak in the podcast. Um, and some of the knowledge that I I I got from them, I then took to scientists. Like one thing people were telling me was that the atmosphere was brighter. And I, for the life of me, I'm not a scientist. I couldn't figure out why this would be the case but there actually is a, a, a conversation that I have with Dr. Greg Henry that talks about inversion and the ways in which you do see changes partially due to climate also there's a cyclical change um, that that can cause more brightness so people's lived experience up there is, is really relevant the north um, you know when you're that high up in the north you're really at the mercy of whether you pay close attention to it you know when something is changing and I think that those stories need to be incorporated into the sort of scientific aspect of climate change you know indigenous communities were here first in Canada at First Nations Inuit in particular and and they managed with a light touch so I think that's also an inspiration that I got from that climate change and something that I, I talked to the lead science uh, writer for the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change about was the importance of Indigenous knowledge. And they're working on bringing in different components to help make sure that people actually understand the importance of, of that lived experience and the cultural practices and management. Uh, we will uh, obviously link to the to, to all the resources here and and uh, the website so people can check it out. You'll find it in the show notes. That whoever, I don't know who does the web design. Do you want to give, I don't know if you know who does it, but like, this, well, that was me. <laughs> you really put well, together all this entire. It is beautifully done. Thank you. I uh, had Jesse and uh, Jesse and Drushko, my audio editor, uh, gave me a hand as well. This is uh, this is a format that we use for some of our visuals. Like uh, you know, you are scrolling through here. You can see that's the boat. Um, it it is absolutely beautiful. So it, it was a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of experimentation to make it look this way. But yeah, I was so happy to be able to use this format. Well, you've done a really beautiful job. Look at this narwhal bones near the shoreline <laughs> uh, hunters leave the bones once they've stripped away the blubber and the meat and polar bears come and <laughs> snack on the rest what an interesting relationship one of my favorite parts about the north is that there's just piles of bones everywhere it's like it's really something to see i do get into some polar bears and i've got some pictures of polar bears on the website you as sure well. do they are uh they are a part of inuit life a story that didn't make it into the podcast if i have a quick second as um i was up there around halloween and people were telling me and this is just their everyday life that um 
during on Halloween, the uh, the RCMP and the wildlife officer patrol around uh, Resolute Bay where I was. Uh, it was also in Greece Fjord, but I'm, I'm not sure what they do. Probably the same thing. And they they drive around to help you know uh, the in, little Inuit children go around house to house and make sure that there's no polar bears. So to go out trick or treating and not become a polar bear snack, Jeez. the RCMP and the yeah the park ranger basically have to patrol around. And and that was just a normal story to them. But I I asked almost everybody I talked to because it was blowing my mind. Huh. What, what was it like for you as a Métis woman um, to, to cover this story? Did, did, is, is that an added layer of meaning to you? Mm. Well, it, it um, I mean, it is different. I'm a guest when I'm there, so I'm, I'm sort of in the same category as a settler. We don't have any mm. um, people. We don't have any people that are that far north. We do have people maybe in the territories. I have some of my people. But um, to go, um, I, so it took that humility, I think, that we all have to, do when we are people telling stories outside of our homelands so i i made sure to bring that um also i probably read i you know they just call me a southerner which probably is like a nice term for white person <laughs> so I, I don't think that they necessarily read me as metis but we did have a chance to have different conversations uh, as as it unfolded to to talk about you know what we do in the south uh, the metis they're familiar of course but um not as familiar as they might be with dene or, or other northern communities you may not prefer this question <laughs> um but did you um do you do you do you personally did you get the impression that uh, these these wonderful people, these resilient people that you talk to, see uh, their way of life uh, in these locations as sustainable. I know you probably don't want to offer your own opinion on, <laughs> right. on whether or not it's sustainable, you know, 50 or 100 years from now. But, yeah. but what did you pick up from them? Well, uh, here I actually think that environmentalists have done a lot of damage. If you remember the early seal hunt conversations, um, you know, the Inuit felt very targeted by that. Um, and, and so I think it created a reluctance to have some of those conversations. But I, I do think that, I mean, there, there's a mixture of, of um, is it sustainable or not? Um, people have been working actually there's solar panels up there i should say up in greece fjord and resolute uh, those can't be effective you know that many months of the year but it but they do work to be uh sustainable and then with hunting there's there's always been community practices to make sure that you don't overhunt. There's a number, even though you're allowed to hunt almost as much as you want, um, there's like a number for each community and each family that you should hunt. And, and I found that people took that quite seriously. Uh, I think that there's, you know, when it comes to flight or diesel, there's certainly some issues there, but that's for the government to solve, in my opinion. Like they moved people up there and they're responsible for them. If you look at Greenland and how that's developed, it is, it, it has nicer housing. They have, you know, two-story housing, and, and they certainly have cultural. They certainly have like social problems in Greenland. But there's been real investment in the community that you do not see up in the high Arctic. That I think is actually quite shameful hmm. when it comes to the Canadian government. This, this, um, I mean, you've done you've done a ton uh, over the course of your career. People probably remember you uh, joined us on the show live from Commonwealth Stadium mm -hmm. as the Pope was there uh, a, a while ago after visiting. Mass uh, you've, you've obviously um, done high profile interviews. You've covered stories of great meaning. Um, but I get the sense that this was a little bit different uh, for you. This was a, a significant um, opportunity in, in your career. I'm always curious to, to pick journalist brain after an experience like this, in particular, where you travel, you see new things, you smell new things, you, exp you hear new, you ex you, your, your senses are probably exploding when you're up there. Um, what sort of a lasting impact do you think uh, this journalist endeavor will have on you did it change your mind about anything that did, did it continue to shape your perspective on some mm -hmm. something specific I think it, it gave me a real understanding of the Inuit that I, I don't think that I had uh, being here in Edmonton we do have some Inuit population uh, but you would have more in Ottawa and and so I haven't had a lot of conversations uh, with Inuit people and and that gave me so uh, just a perspective on on their lives on their stories and on the particular struggles to them you know often we see kind of a collapsing of, of stories of indigenous people being like first nations metis and inuit as though it's all one shared experience but it isn't and i think that there's a really interesting difference and there's some nuance that i hope that i explore there be it visual be it song story culture um and uh, lastly you know i have arctic fever i just cannot wait to go back i i love it up there and it was 
uh, among one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Uh, the people were wonderful. And yeah, I, I already am just scheming on how I can get back up there. Well, I would imagine that you so you do this six part series and, and you, you're probably going, this could have been a 60 part series. There, there's there's a lot more you could tell and and mm-hmm. um, and certainly a, a lot more to uncover. But man, did you ever do a beautiful job with this? Congratulations! Thank you. Um, I happen to see on your podcast ratings. It's always great. We we sure appreciate when we put podcasts out there when people rate them. You're, you're averaging a 5.0. <laughs> I hope you know. So yes. congratulations. There's on only that. about nine, but yes. Well, there's ten now because <laughs> oh, I rated it. Excellent. I gave you a five. Yeah, yes. but five but, stars, please but, rate and subscribe. But to, to average five stars is great. And in all seriousness, when people do subscribe and rate it and share it with their friends. Friends, um, it's going to give it more exposure and obviously uh, create more opportunities for more journalism like this. Mm-hmm. So very nicely done. Thank you. Um, before we wrap, is there anything I always like to ask people? Is there anything I haven't asked you about that you think is pretty significant about this project? Um, I think the the name is interesting. So uh, the name is kind of a spin off of Al Yuituk, which is the Inuktitut name for Resolute Bay, which is the place that thaw or the place that never thaws. You have the place that never thaws, and then I believe the place that never melts is Grease Fjord. Uh, except now that these places are melting so that's that's the spin-off that's why it's called the place that thaws is that we um we're experiencing these drastic changes to life nowhere is that more evident than the arctic where they see glaciers recede where there's rising sea levels melting permafrost uh, which changes the structural integrity of what their buildings are built on um, these are all things that are are going to be happening in the future there's um that's just an inevitability at this point but we need to make sure that we're ready and that we're adapting and that we're also respecting the people that we that live up there to prove Canadian sovereignty. You know, we don't even have time to get into that, but that's why they were moved up there to begin with. And so to have the territory, I know it's a loaded word, yeah. but, uh, but occupied, so yeah, to speak, exactly. to, have, to have it populated. Yeah. Yeah, so um, like I said, we couldn't go into that completely, but there was some concern that the Americans were trying to take over our space. There was a kind of a Canadian paranoia about the Arctic that they they thought having people who live up there would help to maintain that sovereignty. And that's a really big sacrifice for you and your family. Uh, you know, you, you lose your whole extended network to go up there, and we're responsible for those people. And we need to make sure that we respect what they want, that we uh, make sure that they have a livelihood and a way of life that they were promised when they went up there. Amazing stuff, uh, Danielle. Congratulations on this project. I know that it's something you you, you put a ton of work into Mm -hmm. and it shows. (laughs) Um, and it's, uh, it, I mean, this is a compliment. It's very easy listening. Uh, I think people are really going to enjoy it. It's an audio experience. You do a masterful job of telling those stories again. It's The Place That Thaws. Uh, you can find it via the links in our show notes or anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, journalist Danielle Parody, our guest in studio. Thanks for joining us here. Thanks so much for letting me talk about the podcast. Oh, absolutely. I'm proud of you. You did, <laughs> you did a really, really killer job. Really nicely done uh, on an important subject matter. Uh, we don't understand enough as, yeah. as people that live here. Um, we don't think enough, I think, uh, beyond our own uh, borders. And isn't it funny here that, you know, we're talking, you know, from we always call it northern Alberta. I had <laughs> yes. somebody call me out the other day that said, do you ever look at a map? <laughs> They're like, Edmonton is nowhere near northern Alberta. What are you talking about? But you went really far north to tell this story. They think it's hilarious that we think we're north. <laughs> Yeah, we're not even close. <laughs> not even close. Yeah. Uh, this conversation was made possible with the support uh, of Real Talk partners like our friends at Friesen Brothers who want to remind you, if you don't yet have plans for your Easter dinner, you're going to be entertaining. You're having people over, family and friends, uh, but you haven't necessarily lined anything up yet. Uh, or for that matter, you'd rather just spend time, quality time with them as opposed to in the kitchen. Why not go with Catering by Friesen Brothers, that custom Easter dinner box an annual tradition for our family. It starts with the staples, the delicious main course, and then you build from there. There's a variety of add-ons. Uh, you can ensure that you're going to build a meal your loved ones will adore. Uh, you pick it up, you pop it in the oven. It's an easy reheat. Every box comes with reheating instructions, so you can enjoy your personalized dinner hot. You can order now by visiting cateringbyfreezen.com slash Easter dinner, or you can go see them in store. And a reminder, the Friesen Brothers Glenora location, this is the new West Edmonton location, opens April 12th at 10 a.m. sharp. Our friends at Apex Automation want you to know that they're hiring right now. If you're a professional engineer looking for new opportunities, you want to reach your full potential, and and quite frankly, you just don't feel like where you're working now is going to do it for you. You're going to want to check out the careers link at apexautomation.ca. This is a team that's expanding rapidly across BC, 
Alberta, Saskatchewan, into Texas, building a culture where amazing people like you can do their best work. If you're ready to grow your career, challenge yourself, learn new skills, you've come to the right place. Check out the open positions. It's always changing, always being updated under the careers link at apexautomation.ca. And all that talk about solar panels, way up north. I can understand how some time of the year they wouldn't work very well, but imagine they'd work like wild i mean it would just be absolutely amazing other times the year they got 24 hours of sunlight up there from time to time kubi energy is all about solar all about canada's green energy revolution and they want you to know that they're hiring as well how about this i love these good news reports around teams that are growing expanding providing employment opportunity for canadians kubi is young they're growing, they're the fastest growing solar installers in the country, and they're reshaping Canada's energy portfolio. Proudly based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, with offices in Calgary, Lethbridge, and elsewhere, Kubi keeps the pace fast and the beer cold. You can check out their work online at kubienergy.ca. That's also where you can submit your resume. Whether you want to work as an installer, salesperson, office manager, in HR, whatever it is, you name it, Kubi would love to find a fit for you at kubienergy.ca. That flew, buddy. Those are some good conversations today. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, Kevin Kevin Royal in, in Ukraine uh, doing yeah. remarkable work out there. He kind of came across as just like, imagine that, hey, you fly home and then you're just back on shift at the fire hall in Edmonton uh, after helping train mm-hmm. Uh, firefighters in a war zone it, yeah. it's never lost on me that these conversations we have we say thank you for your time and then we move on but it's like yeah i, I think, hope that this is landing you know with people yeah and nikki said something that was pretty f- profound too she's like it's just quiet here you know what i mean mm-hmm. and that was another thing i uh, i remember around remembrance day i think it, we had the, that veteran on who was talking about how you know ptsd when they come back from war zones and stuff like that and he was talking about you know sitting in a classroom or a meeting or something like that and just just the fact that you don't hear gunshots is like so it's it's such a contrast when you go somewhere like that and i don't think people realize that because you know we have a week or whatever where there isn't a bomb strike or there isn't you know a hundred people die in the in in this fire or whatever over in ukraine but it's still a horrific place to be right now it's just like it's mentally, if not violently draining, it's, it's just every day you're hearing the sounds of war and it must just, you're, it it must just take a toll. And then you've got kids growing up in this environment where it's really going to shape who they become later on. And now, you know, I'm not going to transition, but you know, the same thing going on over in, in Israel, Palestine right now, you've got kids and young people growing up thinking this is a normal environment and it, it can't be good for the future. Right. So, yeah. Well said, man. Yeah. Well said. Uh, we welcome your thoughts. Uh, we, we, we recognize we covered a lot of ground in this show and, and so much matter, today, in, in we most went. of our shows like, Oh yeah. We also talked to Racky Pancholi. Uh, we haven't even, we haven't really broken that one down, but uh, she, she still sounded like she was in campaign mode. Didn't she? I mean, she, she did. She still, it was, it was I, I understand that that was probably a difficult decision for her. She very much wanted to be leader of the Alberta NDP. And I think down the road, there's uh, a, a, an outcome where mm-hmm. that does happen at mm-hmm. some point. Uh, not right now, obviously, as she withdraws from that race, but uh, an impressive candidate kept it classy at the end when we <laughs> asked her about minister Dreeshen's tweet. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's why people like her, but uh, I, I think uh, she, she's, She's a chess player, not checkers, and she really is doing the right thing. And I'll just provide an example. You know, I saw three or four people who got very vocal on my social media uh, when Racky put her hat in the ring to be leader who were like, you know, basically, you know, looked like they were working for her, but weren't like posting every day, trying to get people out to vote. And literally uh, two of them yesterday I saw flipped and put up posts where they were like we need to get on team nenji and i think that's exactly what she was talking about today people trust and respect rocky and i think you're right like if if not all of them most of them are going to come over and support ned you know moving forward which is which is what they need right now and she when she talks she wants to better the party it's not about Mm -hmm. her it's not about her becoming leader and and all this stuff she's like we saw numbers 
He's doing what we want to do, so I'm going to jump on that team. Right? Interesting comment though from Jillian, and, and we put it in front of Racky, where she basically said the you know the NDP you know Nenshi hasn't done any of the heavy lifting. He comes in as the outsider. Uh, you know the party's going to lose in. its you know slides in. Uh, <laughs> party's going to lose its grassroots feel, and and there's maybe a point to be made there. Mm. Um, you know, I, I mean, grassroots are, are obviously incredibly important in, in uh, growing a political party. And, and then at some point, you got to go also, like, what's our playbook to victory? Mm-hmm. How are we going to, you know, form government again? And, um, and obviously, there's a lot of different opinions on that. And the good news is, is we have a ton of talk shows to figure this out and to cover it. And, you know, what's going to be the United Conservative response for that matter? Uh, Daniel Smith, you know, we asked her about it when she was with us recently, uh, asked her about at that point, Nahed then she had just entered the race. And, and you remember, she famously just didn't even mention his name. <laughs> he who should not, he, he was, not like, was like a Harry Potter episode. No, she said the person who was just talking there. Yeah. That was yeah. exactly. What so, she said. you know, it's not up to the government uh, at this point. It's not in the government's best interest uh, to spend all its time watching the official opposition's leadership race. But you better believe they're paying attention to it. And oh, of course, yeah. there's going to be implications. And, and uh, that's something that we'll have plenty of time to talk about down the line, fueled by your comments and your feedback. And we thank you, uh, those of you, the engaged citizens that do take the time to send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. I want to give you a quick heads up uh, because the Easter weekend is upon us on uh, the Friday and the Monday. We're not going to be doing shows. We're going to be spending time with our families um, and taking a couple of days away from the studio, which means that uh, tomorrow, if you listen to us daily, God, Gosh, do we ever appreciate that? That'll be uh, March 28th. Uh, that'll be our final episode of the week, which means it'll be an early edition of the Flamethrower presented by our friends at the DQs and Palisades de Mayo, Newcastle, Westmount, Baseline Road. If you have something you need to get off your chest, uh, now is the time to send us that email to talk at ryanjesperson.com and we'll be wrapping tomorrow's episode with an early edition, a Thursday edition of the Flamethrower. Coming up on Thursday's show, we're going to check back in with Max Fawcett. Uh, If you are a regular listener or viewer of this show, you know Max, uh, the lead columnist uh, for Canada's National Observer. He makes the argument in a recent piece that the provinces are actually driving inflation. In other words, it's up to premiers like Danielle Smith to look in the mirror when they're talking about that affordability crisis. Max will argue his case and we'll look uh, at what you have to say about it coming up soon. We'll talk then. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer.